This week, we're beating a dead horse over a good cop and bad cop. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending November 13th, 2021. All week long, I've been planning to talk about good cop and bad cop. Well, you know, cop 26 and cop 9. No, I'm not talking about a history lesson. I'm talking about the UN's pivotal COP26 to address the climate change and COP9 to address tobacco control. I planned on making light of the hypocrisy differences between air pollution, which kills 7 million people a year, and cigarette smoking, which kills 8 million people each year. The WHO, Conference of the Parties, is the supreme governing body of the International Convention. All states that are parties to the convention are represented at the COP, so they can review the implementation of the convention and any other legal instruments that the COP adopts, and take actions necessary to promote the effective implementation of the convention, including institutional and administrative changes. This is a big deal, people! All the world's leaders, or their delegates attend COP to hammer out the steps needed to solve the world's problems. Well, not all the world's leaders, but all the leaders who want to work together on the common goals of saving lives. Yet there is such a disparity between COP26, which aims to save 7 million people, and COP9, which needs to save 8 million people. Let's just take a look at how the news covers both of these COP meetings. Here's COP26, and here's COP9. Doesn't make much sense if you ask me, but it might have something to do with the fact COP26 was open access to any legitimate interested party. And COP9 was a closed access to all, but those who agree and are party members of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which was proposed by Iran. Yeah, the disparity continues. COP26 saw 197 parties and had 21,695 registered participants. Meanwhile, COP9 saw 161 parties and had only 1,200 virtual delegates present doesn't make much sense when you think about 7 million lives versus 8 million lives. Now does it? Anyway, enough beating a dead horse. It's time to find out what was the outcome of COP9. It's time to find out what did the 161 parties and the 1,200 virtual delegates decide at COP9? What did they accomplish that's going to impact our lives as ex-smokers? Well, First and foremost, these idiots doubled down on tobacco prohibition and more taxes. Here's Ukraine announcing that they're going to implement a 20% increase in tobacco taxes every single year until everybody quits smoking. Hello? Ukraine already has an extreme tobacco tax rate, somewhere between 51 and 75%. You Germans watching this video can now understand why your extreme vape tax, it perfectly fits in with this global agenda. And yes, this is a global agenda that we're going to see unfold here. The EU representative, Philip Borko, has left COP9 with a mission to double down on tobacco tax increases for the EU. Guess these morons are just true believers in CTFK raising tobacco taxes or the Bloomberg knows best agenda. Nobody likes taxes, but cigarette taxes are well, something different. Yeah, here we go again with Bloomberg money and more taxes. Steve Forbes just told these guys why tobacco tax hike schemes are a big mistake. But rest assured, knowing that massive tax increases are now an inevitability for all of us. Don't believe me? Well, here's the conference room where COP9 took place. Do you see how many people are in attendance? 
in the building. And yeah, I know you're going to say, oh, it was a virtual event. It was a virtual event. Okay. Well, how about here's COP9 president of match, Eshmael Bagha Hamana, demanding that all attendees protect public health from tobacco industry interests. We need to remain aware of the inherent and easily concealable conflicts between the tobacco industry's interests and public health policies. And while some delegates like Guatemala and Philippines actually stood up and fought for changes, the resulting text is not too much different from the original text. What happened to UK fighting for tobacco harm reduction? This was truly a missed opportunity to save lives by adopting the UK's harm reduction approach. Meanwhile, the head of convention secretary had said, Journalists from around the world have been able to sit in on our discussions and observe our work. This is an important development as we display our commitment to transparency and desire for further scrutiny concerning the implementation of the WHO FCTC and the functioning of our governing body. She continued on by saying, Like all other treaties, the parties, the states whose agreement and resolve form the basis of our existence are the ones who make the decisions. And we, the Convention Secretariat, and our colleagues in the WHO support your work with evidence-based information to underpin your decisions aimed at improving global health. Evidence-based information? Where was the evidence-based decision-making when tobacco harm reduction was left off the table at COP9? Anyway, COP9 is now over, and here's what they decided. Panama City, Panama will host COP10 in 2023. Who needs more money to increase tobacco control and eradicate illicit tobacco trade? Hmm, the very trade that they created by implementing their prohibitionist level excessive tobacco taxation. So... COP9 has closed with an agreement to embark on an innovative multi-million dollar financial plan to strengthen global tobacco control measures. Truth is, it's all about the money. It's always about the money and not about public health. But the implemented protocol to increase tobacco controls and eradicate illicit tobacco trade now lays the foundation for the next secretive virtual event, MOP2, in which only 63 parties, soon to be 64, will decide to form a similar investment fund to adopt the WHO illicit tobacco trade protocol. What is the tobacco trade protocol? And what are they going to do with all this money they plan on spending? I don't know. It's a big secret. Moving on to the FDA and their need for more money. U.S. President Biden nominates Robert Califf to again lead the FDA. No, 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 not that pharmacy industry shill. Yeah, this is the same now 70-year-old buffoon that Obama had run the FDA in 2016 when the FDA's deeming regulations came out for e-cigarettes, cigars, and other tobacco products. This is the guy who called for an immediate ban on flavors and vaping products and said that if vaping products were considered a drug, the youth vaping epidemic would have never happened. Because that works so well for OxyContin, doesn't it? This guy is a medical fraud and was a fraud when Obama made him FDA chief. Robert Califf is a total pharmaceutical industry shill and even pushed fraudulent Xarelto clinical trials to displace warfarin that's been used since the 1950s, further driving up your prescription drug costs. <coughs> He's even done work for Bayer, Janssen Pharmaceutica, who you might know better as Johnson & Johnson, and who knows how many others. He served on multiple FDA advisory committees, which approved products that later resulted in class action lawsuits that proved those products were harmful and then had to be taken off the market. 
This guy is a two-faced pharma shill that collected a salary from Merck and Novartis and four other drug makers. No, actually, this guy received money from 23 drug companies while being a professor, a research professor at Duke University. This guy incorrectly linked a volley to legitimate vaping products instead of pointing the finger at the real problem, black market THC carts in 2019. Man, this guy's been down this road before and screwed harm reduction because of big pharma ties that are plain as day. This guy's just a bully and thinks that vaping needs a regulatory trifecta. What is a regulatory trifecta? Number one, require tobacco industry lower nicotine to sub-addictive levels. Even though he knows it's the additives in tobacco that make the nicotine so addictive in cigarettes. Number two, ban over-the-counter vaping products. Number three, support a prescription model for vaping. You folks in the UK wondered why the U.S. vapers weren't excited about prescription vaping. Well, this is why. The NHS is a government-funded health care system. While here in the U.S., the U.S. government funds big pharma, big tobacco, and the biggest, most expensive health care on the entire planet. So... While Wales plans to be smoke-free by 2030, the U.S. will continue its harmful tax and ban approach. Well, until this corporate shill gets into power at the FDA. And then the U.S. can join Australia in requiring a prescription to get not just nicotine like in Australia, but a pharmaceutical vaping product. Mark my words, people. The U.S. is moving towards big pharma and big tobacco takeover of what's left of vaping. Well, unless one of the court cases forced the FDA to approve consumer-driven vaping products. And more importantly, unless all of us vapers really start advocating to save what's left of vaping. You know, maybe a corporate hostile takeover is exactly what's going to be in the future for vaping. We already know what the FDA authorized for the U.S. market. And we already know the World Health Organization, FCTC, says it's cool to be cruel because it's all about the money. Moving on to Kenya, where Kenyan doctors urge cigarette smokers to use safer alternatives. Published in HapaKenya.com, we find Kenyan and other African medics begging the WHO to save millions of cigarette smokers by supporting safer alternatives. The Kenyan appeal comes in support with a letter by a hundred independent experts in tobacco and nicotine, science and policy. The group has called on the WHO to modernize its approach to safer alternatives, such as e-cigarettes and nicotine pouches. The group also advocated for the incorporation of effective tobacco harm reduction into the WHO's FCTC. Dr. DeLon Human said, Scientific evidence shows that vaping and nicotine pouches are much less harmful than cigarettes, and they can offer smokers their best chance at quitting a lethal habit. He also said public health policy should acknowledge that these potential lifesavers would have a hugely positive impact in low- and middle-income countries, where 90% of deaths for non-communicable diseases occur. Backed by science once again, vaping works to quit smoking. Moving on to more local vaping news stories... From the UK, illegal cigarettes and tobacco seized from Starbridge store. Following a tip-off from the public that the owner was allegedly selling illegal vapes and tobacco to school children, Dudley Council's Trading Standards and West Midlands Police visited the store on Friday, November 12th, but have not revealed its location. A search made using powers under the Consumer Rights Act of 2015 revealed around 5,000 pounds worth of cigarettes and hand-rolled tobacco within a compartment under the counter. A further examination revealed more than 180 illegal disposable vaping pens, all containing dangerously high levels of nicotine. All illegal products were seized, 
and the council confirmed it will be pursuing further action against this business operator. Moving on to Korea. On announcement of Biden's pick for FDA chief, a market research group immediately issued updated market status and business outlook for the vaping industry. Among the affected companies were International Vapor Group, Jewel Labs, R.J. Reynolds Vapor Company, Altria Group, PMI, and Imperial Brands. Do you see who's going to benefit from this FDA change that Biden just proposed? Moving on. From Manila, Philippines, Philippine DOH on Wednesday disassociated itself from the Philippine COP9 delegation after it made pro-tobacco industry statements at COP9. What were these pro-tobacco industry statements they supposedly made? According to the DOH, the Philippine delegation made statements that promoted the interest of tobacco industries including those of vapor products and heated tobacco products. The DOH even described them as salutary and source of good during the ongoing Ninth Conference of the Parties. The DOH, however, maintained that there is no good in tobacco and that giving misleading information that dilutes the risks of tobacco products and undue recognition to tobacco industries, including those of vapor products and heated tobacco products, is harmful. The statements made by the Philippine delegation negate the very principles of the WHO FCTC and undermine progress Philippines has made to curb tobacco use. More like the Philippine delegation spoke the truth and it goes against the WHO prohibitionist mentality. And they can't have that. Want proof that the Philippines delegation spoke the truth and not some tobacco industry propaganda? Here we have this article. Philippine commits to science in solving smoking problem. Foreign Affairs Secretary Theodoro Luxon Jr. called on the World Health Organization to regain the momentum of tobacco control and consider evolving and latest scientific information in solving the global smoking problem. During the opening of the conference on Monday, Luxon said tobacco is a source of bad health, but acknowledge that it also is a source of good through taxation. Tobacco tax laws fund our poverty reduction, universal health care, and the COVID-19 recovery programs. They underscore the importance of tobacco use and funding of the state's most important activities. Loxon stressed that the Philippines' position is for regulation and taxation noting that a total ban is not under consideration due to the unwanted consequences that it poses. No extinction by extreme taxation. Bans would only drive operators underground and substitute smuggling. That would further entrench countries that have made a tobacco a state monopoly. And why would we allow that? Loxon said the Philippines is looking forward to a face-to-face -face meeting at COP10 to tackle treaty instruments and technicalities. He also reiterated the importance of inclusivity in the discussions. These complex and challenging issues demand the active participation of all parties and inclusive consultations with all stakeholders. And we mean all. The updating report to COP10, according to Lawson, must be done with transparency and in full consultation with all stakeholders so that our national experiences are all taken into account with due importance according to each. He also said that the reports must reflect the latest and evolving scientific information to cover the far less harmful novel tobacco products. Loxon said the Philippines passed two more excise tax laws that ban the sale of e-cigs to minors and ban flavorings on vapor products. These laws recognize the fundamental difference between various tobacco and nicotine products and acknowledge that the benefits of continuing taxation on a revenue-rich activity. See? I told you he was just speaking the scientific and factual truth. Not some industry propaganda. Just like what Colombia did. From Bogota, Colombia, we find who again closes the doors to civil society at COP9 platform for nicotine harm reduction to the FCTC of WHO and with total secrecy on the part of the organizers. 
Independent medical experts have made detailed mention of the scientific evidence demonstrating how risk and harm reduction strategies and tools, such as alternative nicotine delivery and heated tobacco products, have the potential to achieve new public health outcomes and favorably impacts the quality of life for people who previously were smokers. As a civil society organization, we have been analyzing narratives worldwide, and we see with great concern the repeated tendency not to speak in essence of public health, but to the securitization of the agenda by talking exclusively about interference and without proposing an inclusive agenda that allows discussions to be made. In different spaces, we have expressed the need to regulate the reduction of risks and harms for tobacco and nicotine in a differentiated, balanced, and proportional way to the risk of each product or alternative, including the regulation of the right of participation of nicotine consumers, the human rights perspective, as well as the inclusion of technological innovations for well-being, social justice, and improving the quality of life of consumers, affected third parties, health systems, and society in general. This position is confirmed by the detailed and independent scientific evidence presented by different medical experts, demonstrating how these alternative nicotine delivery and tobacco heated products have a favorable impact on public health and quality of life of people who were previously smokers and their closest circles. In addition, these products have become an alternative that allows reducing the risks and damages in smokers. And in countries such as England and Japan, they have helped to reduce sales of combustible tobacco exponentially. We know the risks of tobacco use, cancer, lung disease, cardiovascular disease, among others. But we also know that millions of people cannot or do not want to stop using nicotine. And they have every right to do so. That is why we must develop, implement, and offer lower risk alternatives to achieve a true decrease in these diseases. It is regrettable that in the face of the effort of many actors, organizations, experts, and scientists to give an academic, technical, evidence-based human rights debate and with regulatory impact analysis, the international decision is to reduce it to the bidding and interference of different types of industry. Our invitation is not to wear down the debate and explore those public health issues fundamental to achieve results with regulatory terms such as the opportunities for risk and harm reduction, the regulation of new devices, technology and innovation in alternatives, prevention, updating of tobacco control measures before reaching their peak or scope, the risks of prohibition or disproportionate regulation. Are you beginning to see that the Philippine delegate was not spouting some tobacco company propaganda? He was simply asking the conference parties to consider reality. Vaping products have been around for almost two decades. Yet this Iranian president at COP9 could not allow anything other than outright prohibitionist measures and the paperwork that he originally wrote as the starting point for the COP9. Anyway, the article continues by saying, it is essential to be pragmatic, to have a structured and multi-stakeholder debate. It clearly points out the quantity of devices that continue to advance, continue to be sold, and continue to be consumed. The result of every minute that we continue not to regulate in a different way, lives are lost because of those who do not allow progress in the debate. It's about our health, our body, and our choices. It's the consumer's voice that's not taken into account. The decision will most likely be insufficient. So we call for effective participation within the framework of the principles upheld by the United Nations. We insist and we call, like many other activists, 
organizations, nicotine users, health experts, social and human rights experts, and even some states at the international level that the WHO, the FTCC Secretariat, COP meetings, and delegations do the following. Number one, cease discussion based on misinformation and omission of evidence of risk and harm reduction and current tools available or under development, such as alternative nicotine delivery and tobacco heated products. Number two, retreat into strategies that deny the broad and effective participation of legitimate actors, such as civil society and others. Number three, evaluate the negative impact on human rights and the right to health produced by the lack of inclusion of nicotine users as active subjects and key population groups for the success of regulatory recommendations and decisions. Number four, resume a debate focused on public health, determinants in health, tools and strategies for reducing risks and harms, health education, comprehensiveness, and the need to differentiate approaches in health. And what did Philippines, Colombia, and anybody else who spoke out of COP9 get for their humble, articulate, scientific based honesty? They got the Dirty Ashtray Award, published in the daily bulletin that is presented to every single delegate on the day before the conference starts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the work of an inclusive government body using evidence-based information to underpin the decisions aimed at improving global health. This is the work of a prohibitionist bully insisting that member states follow the Iran-developed FCTC for unanimous adaptation around the globe. There was zero chance for tobacco harm reduction at COP9. And the Canadian Vaping Association called them out for it. Canadian Vaping Association COP9 will not discuss tobacco harm reduction, preventing transparent dialogue on WHO vaping recommendations. Ahead of COP9, many organizations, including the LCA, criticized WHO's regressive approach to regulating safer nicotine products. In particular, the all-party parliamentary group said, the WHO recommendations were not fit for purpose. In an APPG report, President Mark Posse says, It is clear that since 2016, the number of people making the change has slowed. And last year, the number of vapors decreased year on year for the first time. This retraction of use coincided with an increase in negative media messaging about vaping and reduced risk products fueled in large part by the position taken at the WHO. The APPG's positions are reflected by the UK Institute of Economic Affairs, which states on its website, the FCTC Secretariat and COP meetings are not fit for purpose in their fierce opposition to vaping and other reduced risk products. They have become a threat to global health and governments that recognize the potential of vaping to save lives should stand firmly for their cause at COP9. If WHO continues to spread misinformation about e-cigarettes, governments should withdraw their funding from the FCTC Secretariat. Okay, okay, I know. At this point, I'm truly beating a dead horse. COP9 is now in the history books. But rest assured, folks, there will still be people complaining about it in the news as not being hard enough on, to, on tobacco control. We're not being hard enough on tobacco control. Think of the children. Think of the children that are going to be addicted if we don't do more. So look forward to more prohibitionist propaganda in the coming weeks ahead. Speaking of things to look forward to in the U.S., here's what happens when prohibition and taxes are simply too much to bear. Coleman found guilty of Circle K armed robbery. At the conclusion of the three-day trial, a 12-person jury found 54-year-old Leslie Lamont Coleman 
guilty of aggravated robbery Wednesday in the January 15th, 2019, armed robbery of a Circle K convenience store in Shelbyville. Coleman and his accomplice, Deontre Cortez Ferris, 21, used knives to threaten the store employee. They were arrested January 16th, one day after they committed the crime. The entire incident was captured on surveillance cameras in the store. Aggravated robbery is when a deadly weapon is used or if the victim suffers serious injury. It is a Class B felony, punishable by 8 to 30 years imprisonment, as well as a fine of up to $25,000. Coleman will be sentenced on January 20th. Ferris confessed to the crime and testified against Coleman. His case has not yet been resolved. Testimony this week included how the pair forced the store's assistant manager to comply at knife point. While waiting for the safe opening, the two men are seen on video stealing an 18-pack of Bud Light beer, cartons of cigarettes, l &M menthols and Newports, various vaping supplies, and the $78 that was actually in the cash register. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending November 13th, 2021. I truly appreciate every single one of you for subscribing and watching this channel's videos. Don't forget to hit that like button or the dislike button to let me know what you think. And, you know, as always, there was a bunch of other news articles I could have covered this past week. But I know most people don't even have enough time to watch this one from beginning to end. So until next week, be good to each other and keep on vaping.